Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Lish Motley. And I'm Navida Ramiz. Coming up in this week's episode. We look at a pilot scheme for Oxford Surplus Cafe. A new website aimed at helping out local independent businesses. And we feature a book fair at Oxford Brooks University. Food poverty has always been on the rise and it's great that people are actually coming out with ways to help solve this issue. We begin the show with the Oxford Surplus Cafe, which offers innovative ways to tackle food poverty. Michelle Jockers reports. From a logical point of view, it seems absurd that food poverty would coexist with food waste. With major food retailers such as Tesco announcing almost 30,000 tons of food waste in the first six months of 2013, it is an issue that can't be denied. But retail is not the only actor to blame. Out of the 18 million tons of annual food waste in the UK, retail only accounts for one third, the rest being equally divided between the supply chain and the households. The Oxford Surplus Cafe, born from the Feeding the Gaps report, is now trying to redirect food waste to tackle food poverty. We went to the pilot event on the 25th of April to find out more. So this is the, uh, the pilot, pilot episode of the Oxford Food Surplus Cafe. Um, we wanted to experiment with this idea of holding a really open event for, uh, for people to come and eat and have a good time, but also to really bring awareness to food waste. <laughs> so all of the food that we're serving today would have otherwise ended up in the bin. We had a meeting yesterday and worked out what we were going to do with all the various food surplus that we'd collected. Um, and we only really knew what we had last yesterday evening, so then planned it all. And then this morning tried to make it work as our plan sort of worked, I think. But one thing that came up with the Feeding Gaps report is that people don't want to have to ask for support with food. You know, it's, you, you don't want to say, I can't afford to feed my family. It's quite a hard thing to do. And so celebrating it, you know, saying that actually this, like everything on my plate would otherwise have gone uneaten. And by eating this food, you're actually doing us a service. This is a really great thing to do and everyone can do it. The aim of the cafe is to bring everyone together. It's, it's helping redress the imbalance in the, in the food system by creating a space that everyone can feel comfortable to come in. And you don't know how much other people are paying, so if you can't afford to pay anything, then that's fine, people aren't going to know. And it's, it's about bringing community together and, and just enjoying food and, and yeah, food that would have otherwise been wasted as well. So, yeah. With the environmental challenges bound to increase in the near future and social inequalities still being a major issue in the UK, one can only hope the Feeding the Gaps report will keep influencing both national and local policies after the general elections. This is Michelle Jokers for Brooks TV News, Oxford. Being an international student, it's great to find everything about shopping at one click. Now a new website has been launched with the help of promoting independent retailers in the city. Neil Wilson has the story. It's often said that many high streets in the UK are all the same, with the same shops and leisure offerings. Whether you're in London, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester or even Glasgow, there's a good chance you'll see the same varieties. I'm here on Corn Market, the main thoroughfare of Oxford City Centre, and straight away you can see all the main high street stores. I can get a newspaper from WH Smiths, grab a coffee from pret a manger buy some new clothes from the likes of Next or River Island, and even get a pint down the road from my local Wetherspoons. However, what if you want to break from the norm but don't know where to turn? Well, in Oxford, it's just got a whole lot easier with the launch of a brand new website. The brains behind the site are Anna Mundy and Rosie Jacobs. I met up with the pair to speak about the new offerings at a bustling independent coffee shop, which has already taken up the chance to be listed on the website. Rosie began by telling me why she was interested in starting the site. Well, for me, um, starting my shop Pinch at Oxford two years ago, um, I kind of felt that there wasn't really a, a base um, independence kind of come together in Oxford. I then asked the pair about the reaction so far from local independent retailers. Absolutely great. 
Um, we've been going around uh, on quite a regular basis, going around different areas in Oxford, um, popping into shops, taking photographs and chatting to each of the owners. And everything, every owner we've spoken to has said, this is a great idea, thank you for doing it. And we want to be involved as much as we can. But why are independent stores so important and what do they add to a city? Well, independent businesses make the city because you know, they add kind of richness and, and, and culture that you just don't get from you know, a vast high street of um, multiple retailers. So. However, with data recently released from Simply Business's annual high street tracker, is this new website even needed? According to the source, independent retailers rose a massive 110% in the past five years since 2009, with the biggest genre of store to be open in 2014 being cafes. We spoke to some independent retail workers in Oxford to gaze their view on the new website. It's really, really good that there's a, there's a couple of young people that have made it quite funky and fresh. And uh, the launch of the independent Oxford website was in Nanny Sloan, um, uh, Nanny Sloan shop on Cowley Road. And I think through there we got into supplying Nanny Sloan with coffee for their warehouse. So it's, it does definitely help out. So, with the help of Anna and Rosie at independentoxford.com, the local retailers of the city stand a good chance of improving their business as well as showcasing what this city has to offer compared to every other high street. This has been Neil Wilson for Brooks TV in Oxford. Now looking into cultural news, the annual Oxford Book Fair took place last weekend in Oxford Brooks University. It offered a diverse selection of collectible books and artworks covering all kinds of subjects and people were literally able to hold history in their hands. Louisa Chung reports. There is nothing quite exciting as holding a rare book in your hands. Visitors to the Oxford Book Fair had the opportunity to amass in a world of bibliophilia and experience the magic of books. This is one of the best and largest fairs of its kind in the UK. It is organised by the PBFA and held every year at Oxford Brooks University's Haddington campus. This year, the event took place over two days and, as usual, offered a wide range of rare antiquarian collectible books manuscripts, maps and ephemera from over 100 of the country's leading specialist dealers. Although this is primarily a book fair, people also had the chance to see a diverse selection of unique prints and artworks. We spoke to one of the organisers of the fair to get his thoughts. The PBFA is the Provincial Booksellers Fairs Association and it's an organisation set up in the 1970s to facilitate uh, booksellers and bookshops from all around the country to be able to offer their books outside their local area. There's a book fair almost every weekend somewhere in the country organised by, by the PBFA. It's an entirely voluntary uh, organisation um, and we, the people who run it are the booksellers themselves. In this year's edition of the fair, some of the most unusual items on display were closely connected to Oxford. A detailed plan of the city from 1850 and an exceptional album of early Oxford photographs were featured on the fair. Other highlights included a copy of the earliest English publication of Magic, illustrating the tricks as something more than hocus pocus. Original watercolour posters from a fundraising campaign during World War II and an album of the River Thames photographs from the 1850s containing some of the oldest surviving images of the Houses of Parliament and Windsor Castle. This is what Michael Kemp had to say about it. It's the earliest known photographic panoramic views of the Thames by a rather eccentric photographer called Victor Albert Prout who had a mobile darkroom on a boat on the Thames and he travelled up and down the Thames taking photographs and developing them actually on the river. And these are views that were done with a, a camera of his own invention. He invented a camera that panned by clockwork so he could take the whole exposure in one go. This has some information on the representation of the empire in Africa. So it was to do with my interest, so I thought I'd snap that up while I, while I still could. I was looking for something very specific, because I collect uh, uh, and, uh, folk music and folk dance books, and I found a couple ones that certainly interested me. This is Louisa Cheng reporting for Brooks TV. That's it for this half, but still to come. We have a look at Oxford Rowing Bump Races. And Ashley Smith gives us a taste of the Brooks 150 year celebratory beer.
Welcome back. We're joined in the studio today by Adrian Pauly from Outburst Festival. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, what can you tell me about Outburst Festival like for our viewers who've never heard of it before? Just it's a festival which has been organised by Brooks for the last, this is the fourth year it's run. It's run in Pegasus Theatre, which is small local community-based theatre, which Brooks has got links with. Mm. Um, basically, Brooks take it over for this time three days, Thursday, Friday and Saturday this coming week and show a variety of things from performances through to talks, through to workshops, and there's exhibitions up in the space as well. Amazing. And um, what kind of people are you aiming the festival at? Is it students or just anyone in the community? It's kind of aimed primarily at the sort of the community, the local community around sort of East Oxford, um, as well as for the students to come and have a look. A lot of students are involved with it. We're showing students films and there's students of that do um, creative writing and showcasing their work. Mm. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a mixture of both really. Yeah, so it's like you're trying to get as many people involved as you can, obviously. Yeah, basically. Um, mm. And there uh, seems to be a mix of art and technology. Was that the main concept behind the festival? Or was that the concept behind it is to kind of sort of um, highlight the innovation and creativity, to sort of get two kind of key words mm. coming out um, that go on in the university that possibly the general public aren't aware of mm. and the program itself was kind of it was kind of the people that said they would do things for us there was no actual deliberate sort of programming in any particular way but there, as you say there is this kind of sort of quite a lot of the technology side yeah. of things and then the more traditional creative arts Amazing. Um, and so we heard you involved with drawing with light event as well can you tell us a bit more about that yeah, that's my long exposure photography thing, which is uh, something I do with um, the first year students because mm. I work in the fine art department. Um, and you basically just have a camera, leave the shutter open for a few seconds yeah. and then get people to move coloured torches around. Um, but we tend to do it on quite a large scale, so we involve, you know, up to, well, if there's 10 people there, we'll do something like a um, street scene. So someone will do lamp posts, other people will do houses and draw it out in the air over the 10 seconds mm. with the, the light and then have a look at how it all <coughs> sorry, all comes together at the end. Yeah, and do you find that's something quite a lot of people are interested in? Do you get a good turnout for that kind of event? Um, generally, yes. Yeah, it's something that appeals to all sorts of ages yeah. from, you know, young kids to the more... Amazing, and how long have you been people. involved with that? With the drawing with the light? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I took my first long exposure. But is it something you like? You still enjoy? Um, yeah, I still enjoy doing it. I enjoy the the way I run the the workshops in the fact that you are involving lots of people and you're kind yeah. of choreographing people. So it's partly you're sort of directing a performance. Okay, uh, that's amazing. Uh, but that, we're out of time for today, but thank you so much okay. for joining us. That's really interesting to hear thank about. Thank you very Albert. much. Thank you. <laughs> Um, on the 18th of April, the Oxford Rowing Bump Races took place on the River Thames, where 18 clubs from around Oxford and London participated. Tellus Vidalis went down to the river to check it out. The city of Oxford Rowing Club accommodated for one more year the Oxford Rowing Bumping Races, in which 48 crews participated in order to have a place on the cap of bump races. Just by the name, you can easily notice that it's not a usual regatta, as the rules differ between the two. Each boat starts on a different position, and when the race begins, they aim to catch up with the closest boat ahead of them, which is considered as a bump. The event is very similar to uh, uh, what the university do with uh, tall pits, and as much as we don't actually have contact, we have overlap, and that's classed as a bump. We, unlike the university, we just have four uh, divisions, two men's, two women's, and also, we do it all in a day. So they're in a in a all day. Every two hours, they have a race. The divisions were formed based on last year's results, placing the crews with most bumps in the first division and the crews with the least in the second division for each group. The city of Oxford Rowing Club seemed to have an easy win on men's division, as crew A managed to keep the first position on every round retaining their title for one more year, followed by Imperial College and their City of Oxford Rowing Club, Crew B. The women's crew of Oxford Rowing Club was off to a good start, undefeated for the first three rounds. Unfortunately, they were bumped at the very last round by one from college, giving them the opportunity to write their name on the cup and claim the head of the river title for this year. 
The event was held from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and despite the stress, tiredness or disappointment, the crews had a smile on their faces throughout the whole day. We have a great bumps race today where beautiful conditions on the water, a uh, really nice uh, set of races, a nice uh, equivalently matched boats and now we get to go drink some beers and uh, have a few laughs. We've had a good day today, so we managed to bump four from five, So, um, and I don't think we expected to do that at all. We're a scratch crew and uh, just put together last night and um, yeah, went out and really pleased with the way the day's gone. So we're quite happy today. The day ended with the awarding of blades to the crews with most bumps but not get bumped on each cycle of each division, which were University of College Men and Women category, the City of Oxford Rowing Club Juniors category, and Walson College. Last but not least, medals and the Bomb Races Cup was awarded to the heads of the river of each division. Uh, so we're really pleased. <laughs> All came together in the last last one. We bumped on the first two and then not on the third one and the last one was when we won it. So we're pretty pleased about that. Yeah, yeah. Today the crews have given their best to achieve glory. However, the journey is not over yet since the Royal Regatta is coming next. Until then, this is Telus Vidalis for Brooks TV. Now as you may know, Oxford Brooks is celebrating 150th year anniversary. Ashley Smith is with the lucky reporter who got to follow up on this story. With summer fast approaching, what better way to enjoy the weather than a relaxing pint? To commemorate their 150 year anniversary, Oxford Brooks have released a special edition beer as part of their celebrations. We went behind the scenes at Shot Over Brewery to find out how the beer was created. We decided uh, with Oxford Brooks University that it should be a beer that reflected what beer was like in 1865. Uh, in other words, we were going to try to re recreate a Victorian export India pale ale. We found a uh, whip bread. 1864 ex export India pale ale recipe which was the nearest we could get to 1865. IPAs, India pale ales, are also have something of a resurgence at the moment and so it, it made sense to do something that was both old and modern and it seemed to chime and so we went with that idea everybody agreed it was uh, it was worth doing. Trying to create a 150 year old recipe you never know quite how it's going to turn out. The first thing I say about the beer is it's big, it's uh, not for the faint-hearted and it's not something that you would go out and drink four pints of on a Sunday lunchtime. It's a, it's, a, it's a beer for sipping, it's a beer for tasting. Is a real ale a good drink to create for a student population? Is there a typical person who drinks real ale? There's def definitely not a typical type of person. Real ale is for anyone. There are so many different styles and flavours uh, from your sort of more chocolatey and stronger uh, porters and stout porters uh, up all the way to your really fruity and citrusy uh, IPAs like the John Henry Brooks beer. We asked some students what they thought about John Henry Brooks ale. It's quite fizzy, which is quite odd at first. It hits your tongue quite fizzily at the beginning. Um, Flavours of are quite sort of general as you get from an ale, is it? That's nice. Yeah, good English ale. Yeah, it's quite strong. It's not that bad. I don't know what I was supposed to be expecting, but it's not that bad. One of the lighter beers I've had. It's actually really nice. It's like, um, orangey. But what about the cost? Is £11 for the largest bottle reasonably priced? Eleven pound and what? So you do get a lot of beer for your money, but obviously it does come with a with a higher price because it's a, a collector's item. What a great way to celebrate the anniversary of Oxford Brooks! Here's to the next 150 years. This is Ashley Smith reporting for Brooks TV. And we actually have a bottle of the Sarah Troy beer here in the studio, which we're all going to drink later to celebrate the 150 years of Oxford Brooks University. That's right, and we'd like to take this opportunity to thank this group and all other groups who have taken part in the current series, as well as all the tutors who have helped us. Brooks TV will be back soon. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching, and don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for past episodes. Goodbye. Bye.